Before I get started in the sermon this morning, I want to encourage you to check out a blog I'm going to submit here very soon. It's about praying that God's will be done. Now this phrase, on earth as it is in heaven, because I think that has a lot of meaning that we might be missing. As it is in heaven. There are many things to pray about for God's will. There is an election coming up that will have massive global repercussions to everyone on the planet, not just here in America, and to the children of God here as well, to all of us. And so we all need to be very fervently praying for God's will to be done in this election. Too many think God's will is set in stone. And uh, if that were the case, then why should we bother at all even bothering to pray? I've been trying to show in the many sermons lately that God's children need to be praying and fasting and beseeching him and turning from our own wicked ways and becoming more zealous, getting rid of being late sea and then lukewarm and apathetic. Uh, time is short. God's waking us up. But that's a specific will when we say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, people are healthy, people are well. In heaven, God's will is done. In heaven, uh, God's law is obeyed. In heaven, people get along. In heaven, they are one. So... We're asking for good things here on earth when we say that. I'll, I'll, I'll write it up in the blog. Now, if enough of us turn to God, he says that if, you, if my people, called by my name, will turn and, and turn and repent of their wicked ways, it says in Jeremiah 18 that when God has purposed to do something uh, as punishment to us, that he will relent from what he has purposed to do. That's in Jeremiah 18, verses 7 to 10 that he will relent, that he won't do what he had said he is, he is going to, uh, to do. Now, our president, I really believe, President Trump, as I record this, this is before the elections, is standing, has been standing, in the way of one world government. He's been standing in the way of the elitists who want a new world order, who don't want borders, who don't want even specific nations necessarily. The elitists. Uh, he pulled us out of the uh, World Trade Organization. He pulled us out of the Pacific uh, Climate Accord. Uh, and he pulled us, I believe he pulled us out of the World Health Organization, or wants to, because they've all been so anti-American and yet want us to pay all their bills. So the real battle going on, there is a battle. God may not be quite ready yet for this end time beast power to appear. The Revelation 13 and other chapters of Revelation about the coming beast power, and Daniel talks about it, uh, and the false prophet, the great uh, Antichrist. The real battle is not between Biden and Trump. It is not Trump v. Biden. The real battle is satanic hordes versus God's angelic hordes. There are real battles going on right now that you and I can't see, but must be aware of, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in high places, Ephesians 6 says. It's that simple. If God, if God's timetable is not yet time for one new world order, for everything to wrap up more or less in a few more years, then the real battle going on is Satan trying to get that going and God saying, no, not yet. So pray like your life depends on it. Pray that you be counted worthy to escape all the things that are about to happen. I think that's Luke 21, 36. Pray also for the Senate of the U.S. Senate, especially those of you outside America. I want your prayers, too, because what happens in this country will affect the entire world. It's literally day and night difference between what the Dems want to do and all they talk about is COVID and how bad it is. But the reality is everything changes if Biden and the Dems get in power, especially if they get the Senate as well. Now, if they get the Senate, uh, Trump could very well be successfully impeached. This time around, it was the Senate that stopped it last time. Anyway, I'll be giving a teaching soon about the, also something else, about the prophesied shakings. I'll shake the heavens and the earth one more time. Um, that that could start happening, and when it starts happening, it's going to be big time shakings. And I think we're going to see some uh, shaking going on even even at, after the election, this particular election coming up in a couple days. Uh, I believe, especially if Trump wins, the whole country is going to be 
uh, cities all over the country will be on fire. There will be people who will not accept the results and will be burning down businesses and homes and attacking people and attacking those that they've uh, cornered as right wing uh, or Trump supporters. We'll see burnings and arson and lootings and violence everywhere. I really believe that all over America. I think Trump will do his best to uh, quell that, but be praying that God give you and his people protection, that he'll protect our president and his wife if they get reelected. If they don't get reelected, pray. <laughs> it's gonna, we're in for a rough time for a while. So now, back to my first part one of this new message. That wasn't the sermon. <laughs> Uh, just I'm hoping this gets posted before the election that you all are praying for it. My webmaster's uh, power went down from uh, Hurricane Zeta, knocked out the power for several days in Atlanta where he lives. And uh, trees down, power down. Anyway, so uh, we can't post this. I'm, I'm recording this still in October, but uh, we probably won't get it posted till November 1 or 2. Anyway, so I want to ask you a question. Where are we now in time? If God, there's going to be two parts to this. So if, if God or his holy, holy angels intend to reveal something from God to people, human beings, who would that person likely be? What kind of people would they be? If there's more than, you know, several of them. If there's a, to be a revelation from God where he reveals himself, shows himself, says something, to whom would God be speaking and working? If God has things to get done on earth, who will he decide to be working with? Who will he decide to work with? For most of us, I think, where natural inclination will be say, well, will be to say, well, obviously the ministers, the prophets, uh, Bible students, the righteous, the humble. And there are lots and lots and lots of verses we could cite that God hears the, uh, and is close to the righteous and the humble and the peacemakers and all of that. Uh, that's all true. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm, that's all true. But if you look hard enough, and I want you to look hard enough in this two-part series, you'll also find numerous places where God worked with people whom you and I would say, you got to be kidding. Him? Her? Really? So I want you to listen carefully today. Think carefully about this because... I believe we're coming to a time of great revelation, great messages from God. And if we aren't looking, if we're looking in our stereotypical places and we're all, we're all in this mold that we put ourselves into, and we can't get out of that mold and crack the mold, crack the box that we put God into, we're going to be missing a lot of revelation. A lot. So listen carefully, and part two is going to be very, very interesting as well. The point of this sermon is to help all of us realize God often has made exceptions to just working with his people, with prophets, with the good people, with the righteous, and so on. He's often revealed himself, at least in his word, to very, very unlikely people in our estimation. And if we don't come to recognize where we're limiting ourselves, we might end up missing a lot of God's revelations. That's what I'm trying to say. Some of us have put God, frankly, into a very narrow box. So I'm especially hoping you'll hear this sermon, and I hope that it'll be a life-changing sermon for you and prepare you for what's coming ahead. So greetings, everyone. I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Philip Shields, and I'm here with another message for Light on the Rock. Light on the Rock, where we seek a, our goal is relationship. You know, you can know about somebody. You can know all about the doctrines of the Bible, and you can keep Sabbath and not keep Christmas and all those kinds of things and still not really have a relationship, a close bond with God in heaven and also a close bond or relationship and a love relationship, not just with him, but with one another. That's our goal. So every sermon I give is trying to help us understand God better to build a closer relationship with him and with one another. So to whom will God work and speak and, and reveal himself? Let me give a couple of uh, foundational points so you understand where I'm coming from as well. There always have been and always will be false prophets who claim God told me last night or I had this dream from God or God gave me a vision and said. There have always been prophets like that, false prophets, and there always will be. 
In fact, Yeshua prophesied in Matthew 24 that there'll be many false prophets, many who will even claim that he was Christ and so on. So we have to be careful to test the spirits. Uh, we'll look at the verses on that soon. That's in, I think, 1 John 4. Test the spirits, make sure they're of God. And uh, Jeremiah 18, Jeremiah 14, 14, we'll post these scriptures up here. What I'm saying is we have to have our guard up. Just because someone says God told them something doesn't mean God did. Jeremiah 14, 14 says, Jehovah said to me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. This is almighty God speaking. The prophets you're listening to or the people are listening to have spoken lies in my name. I haven't said them. I haven't commanded them or spoken to them. They prophesy to you a false vision, false dreams, divination, worthless things, and the deceit of their heart. I didn't tell them what they, when they come up to you and say, the Lord said this, the Lord said that. Most of the time, those probably are not revelations from God. And I'll give many other verses in the notes. Jeremiah 23, verse 21, and many others. So beware of that. And I'm aware of that. The other thing is if a minister or prophet or self-proclaimed apostle tells us to believe anything that goes against God's word, against his law, against his way, no, no, that cannot be of God. Isaiah 8.20 is very clear to the law and the testimony. If they don't, do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. No light in them, God's not in them. We need to be like Bereans in Acts 17.11. Acts, Acts 17, Bereans were people who went and checked out in the scriptures to see if everything Paul was saying was right. Finally, if some prophecies, or, or, or one more point, if some, someone prophesies or tells you a specific outcome is going to be, you know, the one who's going to win this election will be Trump, will be Biden, and it doesn't happen. And they claim God told them. I'm hoping it's going to be Trump. I am. I really am. I'm fearful of a Biden victory. God's will will be done. But God's will, if he lets Biden in there and, and Kamala, it's going to be drastic changes for all of us. It means we must be very close to the end. If Trump gets in, I think America still has some work to do. I'm looking for Trump to win, but I'm not about to tell all of you, absolutely, God told me in a dream or whatever. But if someone does that and it doesn't pan out, or it could be any prophecy. If someone says so-and-so died or so-and-so was killed and it doesn't happen, then you have a false prophet on your hands. And be careful. So here again in Jeremiah, I think this one's Jeremiah. Hang on, let me catch my notes again. If they give a, a specific outcome and they say the prophets prophesy lies in my name, I have not sent them commanded them or spoken to them. We'll put the scripture up there on the, where, where I'm reading this. They prophesy to you a false vision, a divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. Okay, finally, if someone prophesies and tells you a dream, he claims it's from God, a specific outcome, and it doesn't happen, God says, absolutely, that's a false prophet. De Deuteronomy 18, verses 20 to 22. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name, anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. Now that was in the nation ruled by God, or the nation of Israel. He said, that's the rule I have. Now we don't do that today because we're not in charge in the nation today. So we don't go around killing anybody. We don't, okay? Please understand that. But he's saying basically that's not from me. Verse 21, Deuteronomy 18, verse 21 and 22. You may say to yourselves, but how can we know when a message has not been spoken by Yehovah, the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of Yehovah does not take place or come true, that is a message Yehovah has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Don't be afraid of him. So if, if, if someone says it's going to happen and doesn't happen, uh, now... On the other hand, many, many ministers, including myself, will say, in my opinion, I think this is going to possibly happen or could happen. That's, that's okay. That's, that's, if you clearly say it's an opinion, it's not a word from God, 
And the uh, best you understand, it could be going this way or that way. That's, that's different. But if I say the Lord spoke to me last night in a dream or a vision, and it doesn't come to pass, or it's against God's law, run. That's not from God. So there are many, many more examples where God dogmatically said, uh, people, where people have said dogmatically, Christ will be here in four to five years, ten years max, and then five, ten, fifteen, twenty years later, we're all still here. If they say God spoke to them on that, that's that's not good. But if it's their opinion, and they clearly stated it as opinion, like I might say, my opinion, God intends a uh, President Trump to continue. That's my opinion. Uh, if it doesn't happen, then my opinion was wrong. Doesn't mean I'm a false prophet. But if I say God told me that Trump is going to win again, and I tell you all that, and it doesn't happen, then that's not a good thing, right? So those are the ground rules. And there are many claiming to have heard something from God when God says, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. All right. So God is speaking, revealing himself. And I really believe as we come into these end time days, we're going to see God's, God's revelations coming more and more and more and more. And they're going to be coming from sources we're not used to having. As long as you remember the ground rules, must be according to God's rule and, and way. It, they must come to pass if they say it's from God. God said this or that. It must come to pass. And so um, uh, be careful. Be careful out there. But at the same time, I'm trying to say in this sermon, there are so many avenues God uses to speak to us that we will miss if we cling to the old stereotypes we had. Now, my first question, would God reveal himself and his plan and things he wants to get done to and through a world leader who may not even be a Christian, may not be a son of God, may not, as far as spiritually, may not have God's Holy Spirit? Would God, now, if, the, if I was talking about King David, yeah, you'd say I could see God revealing himself to King David or Solomon as he did. But I'm talking about a pagan leader. Someone who doesn't believe in the God you and I believe in. Is it possible that we could see God working through, revealing himself to world leaders? And I say, yes. Be prepared for it. Turn to Isaiah 45. There's an astonishing scripture here, chapter Isaiah 45, verse 1. Thus says Jehovah to his anointed. Now, anointed means... It's the same Hebrew word where we get Messiah, Mashiach, okay, Mashiach in the Hebrew, Messiah. Same Hebrew word. You could say Jehovah says to his Messiah, <laughs> okay, because every king of Judah and Israel were anointed as king, and they were called the anointed ones. They were called, and the word for anointed is simply Messiah. Now, there is the Messiah, who is only Christ, only Yeshua, Son of God. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed. Okay, But there were many who were anointed. There were many who were called Messiah, including this guy, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held. Cyrus. This was written about somewhere between 120 and 150 years before Cyrus was even born. So who is this Cyrus whom God is saying something to? He was the Medo-Persian. He was the Persian ruler who conquered Babylon. He diverted the river, the Euphrates River that came through Babylon. And, and so the water was no longer uh, going through into the city. And he just simply marched his troops on the dry bed while inside they were having a drunken orgy with the, with the uh, uh, instruments, uh, the uh, the the bowls and the cups and the glasses and so on that were used in the temple, in, in God's temple. They were having an orgy, a drunken orgy. In the meantime, Cyrus leads his army in there and conquers the unconquerable Babylon. So this was 150 before, 150 years before he was even born. No doubt he was not a televangelist. He was not a minister, a rabbi, a pope, a cardinal. A religious leader. He was not even an Israelite. He didn't believe in God. He didn't even exist yet. He wasn't certainly a Jew. And he certainly was not a righteous person or a pious person. 
He wasn't even born yet, like I said, okay? As a man, do you think Cyrus was righteous? I doubt it. He was a pagan emperor, and they could kill whomever they wanted. They can order someone's death at will. And calling him the anointed just meant God had a special purpose for him. doesn't mean he was pious or righteous or, or, or a good man. Kings of Israel were anointed, and this guy was anointed in that sense in God's mind. Um, yet God intended to use this man, an outsider, and to reveal his intentions through him. Uh, Isaiah 45, let's read it again, verse 1. Thus says Jehovah, the Lord, to, this, to his anointed, to his Mashiach. To Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and to loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so the gates will not be shut. The double doors would refer to either the double doors of a big temple or the double doors into a city. And um, I'm going to open before him the double doors that can't be shut. I'm going to open the way into this place. Of course, he did become the one to conquer Babylon. But remember, there was no chapter breaks in the original Bible. And so if we go back to the end of chapter 44 of Isaiah, where it talks about leading up to Isaiah 45, obviously, the last couple of verses of Isaiah 44, verse 28, God speaking, who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd. Imagine that, a womanizing, pagan, man-killing, tough, vicious, Persian, we call them Ira Iranians today, okay? And he shall perform all my pleasure, God says. Saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built. This is 150 years before he's even born. And to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Isaiah 44, 28. Keep it up there for a while. Let, let, that, let the words from God sink in. And Cyrus was indeed used to open doors for the Jews to rebuild the temple of God in Jerusalem, the second temple. And Cyrus was the one who released all of the captured instruments and utensils and things from the, from the uh, temple and had them go back. And so, um, and he also asked the people around them to bless the effort, to provide the money, to provide equipment. There are over 20 mentions of Cyrus in the Bible, mostly in the book of Ezra, and then here also in Isaiah. In 2 Chronicles 36, verses 22 and 23, Jehovah stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, and then decreed there shall be a new temple. Then he decreed it. You also read that in the first couple of verses of Ezra. We'll put it up on the board. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. These, Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, they, these were the people who went back from Babylon to Jerusalem after the 70 years of captivity, and they wanted to rebuild the city, repair it, restore it, and to start a second temple. Ezra 1, verses 1 and 2. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Jehovah by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. That was about the 70 years. Uh, Jehovah stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. So we have a spirit in man that interlocks with God's Holy Spirit. So there's a spirit element in every one of you. Now, in me and you, all of us have it. It's called the spirit in man. You can do a search on my website and just type in spirit in man. I have a couple sermons on it. So that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, Thus says Cyrus, the king of Persia. This was pretty much the leading empire of the world at the time. All the kingdoms of the earth, the Yahweh of, or Jehovah of God of heaven has given me. And he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So imagine that. God put that thought in his mind. So how can he use Cyrus or any world leader, unconverted and carnal as can be? Yet he does. And here's a proclamation from God who stirred up his spirit to make this proclamation. That could happen, you folks. To President Trump or to whoever is the president. I think it will be Trump. It could happen. Imagine getting a, imagine getting, uh, is it President Xi, is that his name from China, uh, saying that the God of Israel has spoken to me and I'm supposed to tell you all this. We wouldn't believe it. We wouldn't believe it. What if Putin said that? What if Angela Merkel said that from Germany? 
we wouldn't believe it. I think we'd have a hard time believing it. Or even if President Trump said, uh, Yehovah, the God of Israel, has spoken to me and wants us to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. I'm, I'm, I'm a builder. I am going to help them do that. What if he were to do that? Would we believe that it came from God? Some of you would not believe. I'm saying you just might be missing some revelations because this Cyrus was not some pious, righteous guy. So Isaiah 45, now verse 3 and 4, we, we read verse 1 and 2 already that he is my anointed and he is my, okay. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, Jehovah, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have called you by name. I have called you by name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I've held you by the hand, he says earlier. Here he says, I have named you, though you have not known me. So clearly, you don't have to know God for God to work with you. Back then, God used and continue to use us, continue to use, I mean, uh, whoever he decides to. That includes leaders like President Trump, President Macron. Uh, the, maybe the Chinese leader Xi and, and others, if that's the right name. Forgive me if I have the wrong one. The European leaders. They don't need to know God for God to work with them. So that's, see, we're used to thinking God works with the humble, with his children, with those that have his Holy Spirit. And that's also true. But God makes exceptions, and this is one of them. Cyrus was a ruthless dictator. Now, all the way through Ezra 1, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, and also in Daniel chapter 1 at the end of it, and chapter 6 and chapter 10, Cyrus is mentioned again. I'll post them on the board even before I said all that, just so if you want to write those down, you can. You can just get the notes too. Some feel that Cyrus, who's listed in Isaiah chapter 45, is not coincidental. might be coincidental, but some believe it's not could be pointing to a future fulfillment of a future Cyrus in President Trump, who is President 45, Isaiah 45, is Cyrus. Cyrus is so pagan that his very name points to the sun, the sun god, as does Pharaoh. The fire refers to the sun as well. That's not my point yet, but if in hindsight tells us later on that this was the case, that God uses uh, President Trump as a type of Cyrus, don't be surprised. Is Trump known as a person of piety and righteousness? Absolutely not. Is he a humble man? Absolutely not. He's a womanizing, vain braggadocio. And yet, I'm sure we find Cyrus was the same way. And by the way, um, in case you didn't know this, uh, except somewhere here in my notes, that, that uh, Cyrus was, a, was the world ruler at the time. Our president's first name is Donald. Look it up. The meaning of Donald is world leader or world ruler. His middle name, John, his middle name, John, points to grace. Uh, God could be saying that I'm going to use my grace through this world leader, Donald J. Trump, to do some things that I want to get done before everything wraps up at the end. So is it possible that even though our President Trump is vain, has been a womanizer, as many of us men have been who are listening to this. God could still use him, reveal his will through him, and maybe even use him to get into, the, into Israel and rebuild Israel and the city of Jerusalem and, and a temple there. Is it possible? Remember, some of uh, Trump's children are Jewish now, or in-laws are Jewish in religion. So be thinking about that. God does not, now if all this doesn't work out because he doesn't get reelected, well then fine. We'll, we'll move on. But God does not, my point is God does not have to use ministers and prophets. I do think he's going to get reelected though. Uh, God does not have to use ministers and prophets. My point in this sermon is to get us to be more alert of other places and other world leaders. Look at some other examples in the past. Pharaoh, Genesis 41 had this dream about six big fat cows that came out of the river. And then, I mean seven, seven fat cows, I said six, I meant seven. And then 
seven very lean and ugly cows come out of the same river and eat the seven fat cows. And the seven heads of grain that were full and lots of grain on them, followed by seven grains that were not, that didn't have any grain on them, and they ate the other grain and didn't look any better for it. That's all in Genesis 41. Go back and read it if you're unfamiliar with the story. My point is, who got the dream? It was a pagan leader again. Sure, Joseph was called on to interpret it, but it was the pagan leader who got the dream, who got the revelation. The explanation came from Joseph, great. But he was a pagan ruler. Certainly the Pharaoh of the Exodus was another one. It's very clear in Exodus 7 verse 5, you'll see it on the board here, 7 verse 5 on the screen I mean, verse, uh, verse Exodus 7 verse 5 and verse 17 and chapter 14, 18 where God says, I want the Egyptians and the Pharaoh and all of them to know that I am God. I, Jehovah, am God and, only, and the only God there is. God certainly made revelations through him, to him as well. Certainly Nebuchadnezzar. God apparently worked with Nebuchadnezzar, blessed him to some extent, and warned him that don't you dare start taking, that's all in uh, Daniel chapter 4, don't you take credit for it. And I sent a letter to President Trump telling him about this lesson from Nebuchadnezzar. Please quit saying that you built this great economy for the first three years. Please say God blessed us with a great economy. Because you keep doing that, you might end up with the same fate, the same ending. I don't like to use the word fate, that's a pagan god. Anyway, don't end up in the same end result as Nebuchadnezzar did, where he had everything taken away from him for, I think it was seven years. And that's all in Daniel 4. Another world leader who saw the, literally the hand of God was a man named Belshazzar. I think, was a grandson, I think he was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Don't hold me to that. But they're having this drunken, sexual, alcohol orgy and making fun of the Jews. And they, he called for all their golden utensils and let's drink from them, let's vomit in them, whatever they were doing. And God got pretty upset about that. I'm sure he was. But anyway, then he saw this hand of a man on a wall writing certain things on a wall. Do you know the story? It's called the handwriting on the wall. That's where that phrase comes from. It goes to Daniel chapter 5. You might want to read up on that. I won't take the time here. I think many of you might know that story already. God revealed something to a pagan, drunken, leader, he actually saw a hand writing on the wall, and then they brought in Daniel who explained it, that his days were, uh, his days were up, um, your, your, your time is going to be short now, and that very night Babylon fell to Cyrus. Okay, you see in connection here, God's working with these world leaders, and I really believe in the time to come at the very end, uh, there will be world leaders that God is working with as well. We certainly know that there will be world leaders that Satan will work with and even possess. It says very clearly the beast and the false prophet were possessed by demonic forces. Anyway, so you know those stories. Uh, there are lots of leaders that I could go on and on about. For example, even when Yeshua was facing Pilate, you know, for the trial with Yeshua and Pilate at, at Passover, Pilate's wife, it's in the Bible, in Matthew 27, 19. We'll post it up, Matthew 27, 19. She sent a message to her husband, have nothing to do with this man. I had a horrible night dreaming about him and don't have anything to do with him. And he didn't listen to her, though. And uh, But my point is, again, who got the message? Who got the dream? Who got the words? A pagan man's wife. So are you ready for that? For world leaders to be the ones that God's giving his revelations to. Now here's another one. How ready are you going to be if God decides to give dreams and visions and revelations to children? 
You heard me right. Children or young people less than 20 years old who are 14, 16, or 9, or 7. To children. Why would I say that? When I say children, I mean 8 or 9 year olds or young teens. By young people, I would say 18 to 25, even young people. Are you ready for God to be revealing messages not to the gray-haired ministers and prophets or people like myself who are 67 years old, but to young, really, really young people? He's done that before. And he, he says he's going to do it again. Are you ready for that? I just think of my own grandkids, of one of them who is 9 or 10 or 12 years old, comes and says, Poppy, they call me Poppy, Poppy, uh, I had a dream. God said it was him talking to me. And here's what the dream was. Scripture tells us without apology that before the day of Jehovah, there will be many young people who will be given dreams and visions. I'll read that in a minute. But if a young boy were to tell you God spoke to him last night, revealed himself to him last night, that he actually saw the word of God standing there last night, would you dismiss it out of hand and think the guy's a little sick? You have to test it. What did he say? And so on. But if you would just dismiss a young 8-year-old or 10-year-old, you might have missed God speaking to one of the best prophets in all the Bible during the time even before King Saul. Uh, even before that, he was a great prophet and judge of God, of Israel. He was just a boy. And I speak of the prophet Samuel. His story is told in the first three or four chapters of 1 Samuel, actually the whole book of 1 Samuel. But um, you should go back and read the first couple of chapters. His mother, Hannah, uh, was a second wife to a man named Elkanah. And the other wife had lots of children, but Hannah had none. And so she went and prayed before God, weeping and crying. And the high priest thought she was drunk. But then when he understood, he asked, may, may God give you, may Jehovah give you the desires of your heart. That's 1 Samuel 2. No, that's 1 Samuel 1 I'm talking about. And then 1 Samuel 2, uh, she said, I will give this child, I'll loan him to God for all of his life, for his whole life. If he would give me a child or children, which God gave her eventually many children. And so in chapter 2, she gives this wonderful, wonderful prayer of praise. All of you, especially you women, should read it. Wonderful, beautiful. And then in chapter 3, he's now a boy. The Bible doesn't give us the age. He's probably 8 or 10 years old or something. But 1 Samuel 3, he's certainly very young still. Verses 10 to 12, he hears these voices. Samuel, Samuel, he thinks it's Eli the high priest. And he goes to him two or three, a couple times and Eli finally recognizes, hey, this must be God trying to talk to him. And Yehovah, 1 Samuel 3, verses 10 to 12, Yehovah came and stood, came and stood and called at, to him as at other times, Samuel, and he said, speak for your servant hears. And Yehovah said to Samuel, behold, I'm going to do something in Israel which will, uh, at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. Will, yeah. And then in verse 19, he has to finally tell uh, Eli that God said you're going to die because you're not, you're not doing things right here in the, in the tabernacle. 1 Samuel 3, verse 19, So Samuel grew, and Jehovah was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. All Israel, from Dan up north to Beersheba down the south, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of Jehovah. Just a kid. Then Jehovah appeared again, appeared again. You know, in verse 10, it says, Jehovah came and stood. Let's put that back up there, verse 10. Jehovah came and stood and called as at other times. And it says in verse 21, Jehovah appeared again in Shiloh. We all say Shiloh, I think it's Shiloh. For Jehovah revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of Jehovah. So Jehovah revealed himself to Samuel by the word of Jehovah. Who's the word of Jehovah? That was the one we know as Yeshua. No one has ever seen God the Father. So he didn't reveal him. God the Father never was seen by Samuel. When it says Jehovah came and stood, verse 21 explains that that Jehovah 
the, that he is being shown to, to Samuel by the Word, who's also Yehovah. I have several sermons about who is Yehovah, depending on context. Sometimes it's God the Father, clearly, like Psalm 110, the first couple of verses. That's clearly God the Father. And sometimes it's clearly the one we know as the Son or the Word of God, as in Genesis 18 when he appeared to Abraham, because no one has seen God the Father. Anyway, that's all in those other sermons about who is Yehovah, if you want to hear them. So God called Yehovah here, even appeared to him by the word of Yehovah. My point is, my point is, the revelation was to a young boy. A young boy. Would you have accepted that, or, would, or, or will you be, um, or will you when that happens again in the years ahead? Are you ready for that? God revealed himself through Joseph, for example. Gave him dreams. He was still a teenager or less when he started having these dreams. That's in Genesis 37, the first 11 verses. That the 11 other sheaves bowed down to him, the, the sheaf. And uh, he was getting dreams from God as a young boy, as a teenager at most. So when his siblings and even his parents, Israel and his mother, heard these things, Rachel, you know, Leah and all the, all the siblings, they rejected it. They, they, they thought, how dare you say that we're all going to be bowing down to you? Would you and I have done any better? I don't think so. I don't know. I don't think so. How about David? When Samuel came and asked uh, Jesse, uh, apparently one of your sons is going to be the next king of Israel. Can you bring all your boys here? He left the youngest one out there to watch the sheep. They had a few sheep. Uh, someone had to watch him. He left David, who was probably, again, just a boy. Might have been a young teen, but just a boy. And even by the time years went by and he fought Goliath, he's being called a youth. Which, is, uh, which can be used, the, the word can be used from a baby all the way up to adolescent. So he's still very, very young, even at that point. And yet God revealed things, many things to David. How about Jeremiah the prophet? Jeremiah the prophet seems to have been just a child, or maybe a teenager again, when God called him initially in Jeremiah 1. Let's read it, verses 4 to 8. The word of Jehovah came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, Jehovah, uh, sovereign Lord, I said, I don't know how to speak. You can't send me. I'm just a boy. I'm just a child. I'm just a youth. The word there in Hebrew, I believe, is N-A-A-R, nar, and it means anybody from a baby all the way to adolescent. But Jehovah said to me, don't say I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to, and whatever I command you to say, don't be afraid of them, for I'm with you and I will rescue you, says Jehovah. So here's the great prophet, Jeremiah, starting off as a 12-year-old, 14-year-old, 16-year-old, 10-year-old, whatever he was at that point. Couldn't be more than probably 16 or 17. Probably younger than that. Would you and I have said, this is ridiculous. He's getting these visions and saying, God saying the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and said, come on, that's ridiculous. I hope not, because that's going to be happening more and more. And we'll get into this a lot more in part two. And, and yes, of course, we're going to test the spirits. First John 4, verses 1 and 2 says, if don't believe every spirit, test the spirits, whether they're of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world and by this you will know the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Now, I have more I wanted to cover today, but let's cover that in part two. And there's a lot more. Okay, so I've talked about world leaders. I've talked about children. And God can reveal himself. And you're going to see in part two that he tells us he's going to use the youth. He tells us to be ready for that and many, many other unexpected sources of revelation. Don't miss part two, okay? But I don't want to go too long in this one, so we'll end it with that. 
And so what we've covered so far is that God can choose whomever he wants to show himself, to reveal himself, and all of that. And we're not ready for it. I really don't think we're ready for it. So um, let's bow our heads and just ask God to dismiss us. Our great loving Father in heaven, Yehovah, our Father, our loving Abba, our friend, our King, our God, and Yeshua, your Son, we come to you also through the Holy Spirit. We just ask you in Yeshua's mighty name to hear us, and we ask you to be definitely involved in the election. This is a major turning point election. We just ask you in Yeshua's mighty name that you're involved, that you're sending your angelic forces to protect your people, to protect President Trump and his entourage, and protect Biden and his entourage. Don't let the violence hit them, Father, please, or anything like that, and their families, their wives, their children. Watch over them. And I just pray that your will be done in this election. And I also pray that you will help us to start opening our eyes to how you reveal yourself in ways that we just aren't used to thinking. And so I'm, I'm please continue to inspire this and open people's hearts and minds to it when we get into part two. We sure thank you and we lift our hands up to you and praise and glorify your holy name, Father in heaven. You're a wonderful, wonderful Father. And I pray for protection on all of your people. It could be violent times coming ahead, dangerous times. And you, Father, will watch over your children. Thank you so much. We praise you in advance for all that you are and all you're doing. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Well, uh, be sure to watch part two. Please do watch part two. So many, many sources of revelation God's going to be using. I think you're, you're going to be really, really surprised in part two. We just set the stage for now. Okay, all for now, and God bless you all. Thank you for coming. Visit the Light on the Rock website, where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.